Hey everybody, Nick and Amber here from Functional Movement Therapy. We have the wonderful pleasure of hanging out and talking with Dr. Escobedo and Dr. Escobedo of Montrose Dental Studio. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting Hi. us to be here. We're super excited. So Absolutely. glad to help. Yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about TMJ dysfunction and we thought who better than to have you guys who, I mean, sure, I'm sure you deal with it a lot and I mean, you're experts and the jaw and the mouth. And so it'd be great to get your feedback on these questions that the viewers have. So, Yeah. So if you guys want to introduce yourself um, and just tell them a little bit about you and what you specialize in. Sure. So Sarah and I are both a general dentist and um, we've been practicing now for almost 10 years or a little over 10 yeah. years, actually. So time flies. Uh, we met in dental school and we've moved and we've practiced here in Houston ever since. So we're in the process of opening our own office right now. Um, but we do deal, like you mentioned, with a lot of TMD patients and um, like TMJ is a very important part of your over your oral health. And so we get a lot of patients who have very similar questions, I'm sure, to many of the questions that you all receive. So we're very happy to help in that regard. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. We're, we're super excited to get your feedback about all of these things and just take a holistic approach to uh, helping people with their pain and dysfunction and getting back to a normal and healthy lifestyle. Yeah, for sure. All right, so should we just jump right into it? Let's jump right in. Um, did you guys want to give uh, an overview of... The jaw. Yeah, I, so I'd love to. Um, thanks again for sharing. You know some of these questions. Everybody, again, you had some really great ones, and we hope that we're going to get to answer all of them. But in going through some of the questions, I think one of the things that we noticed right away is that there seems to be kind of um, a misconception just overall with just the nomenclature of how we define things. So a lot of people mistakenly refer to TMJ as a problem, when actually TMJ is just your joint. So TMJ stands for temporal mandibular joint. Right. We all, it would, it's like having a knee or an elbow. So it's not necessarily a condition. What you have is you have TMD, you have temporal mandibular dysfunction. If you're having pain and symptoms. And so I think that in and of itself is where we, we'd like to start is that everybody has a TMJ. Um, it's a normal joint that we use a thousand times throughout the day, whether we're talking, we're eating, um, it's very unique in the sense that it's a double hinge joint. It's the only one in our body. And it's, uh, it's very, when you have pain or you have problems with it, it, like any other joint, it's so much easier, like with your knee, just to not put any stress on it. Mm -hmm. But we can't tell you to not eat or not talk for <laughs> an extended period of time. Right. Yeah. It makes this one a little harder to manage for sure. So mm -hmm. anyway, I just wanted to kind of give a quick overview of that and the fact that when we're, when we're referring to problems or issues, we're referring about TMD, but TMJ is just a normal part of our body. That's a really good call. It's just getting the name right and know, and just knowing what you're talking about and being educated in the joint versus the dysfunction, because I, I think we may have yeah. said just TMJ a couple, you know, a couple times too. Because we get um, so used to hearing it that it, you know, yeah. you can stop correcting people or stop thinking about it as that yeah. so. Oh, that's a great point. So it's, it's very easy to do, for sure. And so even when we're talking to patients, sometimes we have to stop and just use the proper terminology so that it ends up being constant into the conversation because it is, it's easily understood as just TMJ. So you want to make sure that your patients mm -hmm. understand you. So then sometimes you pick up on the same verbiage as well. Right. So. And let me just ask you, I guess I have a question for you guys, but when someone comes to you and they think they may have TMD, what sort of things do they tell you or do they say that makes you, you know, that would lead you to the fact that, oh, maybe we should look into that? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the big things is just pain. So pain yeah. upon opening or closing, if they've ever locked open or locked close, those yeah. things aren't normal. Um, if they complain of clicking or popping or noises. Um, sometimes that is, it's just part of, you know, normal wear and tear. So a lot of the big things is if there's pain associated with it, then that's when we'll be more proactive in our treatments and trying to figure out how to manage the symptoms. Um, some other symptoms include maybe some um, mild dizziness or headaches or just a lot of stress and tension around the neck and the, the um, kind of the temporalis right around the forehead. And so we have to distinguish whether it's 
purely because of the joint and the muscle or if it's just a headache or if it's something going on with the ear itself and then that would be another specialist involved. So everything's connected and we just kind of have to break it down little by little to see if it's just mm -hmm. the joint, if it's muscles. Um, and so kind of doing some investigation, trying to figure out where would be the best way to manage mm -hmm. the symptoms. Yeah, no, thank Absolutely. you for explaining that's, that that's because awesome. I feel like a lot of people, even if they just have a toothache or something else going on inside their mouth, you know, everyone's like, oh, I've got T TMJ. Right. TMJ. You know, people <laughs> always say that. So it's good to distinguish, you know, what you guys would do. That would be. Yeah. Too. And if there's ever any questions, I mean, you go to your local dentist or, you know, ENT or your physical therapist, and then these are normal questions to ask. Yeah. And then, yeah, we're always there to figure out what would be the best way to get things taken care of. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Well, that was my question. Um, <laughs> I guess we have other ones that we have to answer, but um, so we just kind of group these first questions. Um, a lot of them were along the same lines and referring to the same thing. So we will kind of try and answer all those in one, I guess, but a lot of them um, had to do with posture. Right. Um, so this first one, you know, we had from Maxime, why does the TMJ pain radiate to my back and what can we do to relieve this neck, shoulder and back pain? Yeah. So that was the first one. And yeah, so things need to be aligned uh, to work properly. And we really want symmetry within the body and we want our spine to have a certain normal level of curvature. However, if things get, especially the head, gets too far forward, what happens is that jaw tends to almost dump, right? You're already kind of forward and um, in the position to then open the jaw and you're placing more tension on the neck and the cervical spine muscles and the muscles of, of chewing, right? Um, so alignment and posture is really, really important there. Yeah. Well, and I think people start to use content, like compensatory strategies too. You know, if something hurts, you, they're starting to use other muscles that might not necessarily have to do that job in the first place. So it starts referring back to the neck and the shoulders. And I'm sure you guys see that too, a lot with your complaints from your... I think that's kind of how I explain it to my patients and, and in talking to Sarah. It's, it's very similar to like having a pebble in your shoe, right? I mean, after a while you can walk on it, but then you start maybe having a little bit more of a gait. And so you start putting weight on areas you're not normally used to when you're walking. So then mm -hmm. other parts of your legs start hurting or your back start hurting. It goes up to your hip and so, things like that. So Especially mm -hmm. when you're chewing, it's just their muscles, you know, and you, yep. when you overwork them and they get really so sore or swollen. I mean, they're going to cause other issues and you're going to start using, just like Amber mentioned, other muscles to compensate, or you're going to start chewing in a funny way, or you're going to move the way that you feels most comfortable for you. Right. Um, right. And it's just going to cause other misalignments and, and other other things to be problematic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's great. And this is off topic, but when I did cadaver lab in anatomy class, I actually had to dissect the face muscles. Yeah. And uh, I mean, besides the eyeball, which really freaked me out, but I mean, there's so many muscles in your face and people, mm -hmm. I just don't think realize because we just, we use them all the time. They don't ever think about them, you know, getting yeah. tired or injured. And right. it's, I mean, it's, it's just like any other muscle in your body. The head and neck is very complex. <laughs> sure. And so everything is, is interconnected, interwoven. And so we yep. can't just isolate one little area. We have to think about the whole big mm -hmm. picture and how it all works together. Yeah, yeah no, a, for it's sure. It's a pretty beautiful system. Yeah. So the next question, you know, are scoliosis and the TMJ joint related? And that's by Andrea. Yeah. And th just like you said, Sarah, right? It absolutely can be if... A part of it, it. Right, a part of this, that alignment needs to be taken into consideration. Um, if your scoliosis is like, typically it's at the thoracolumbar kind of area. Yeah, it's usually um, mid to lower back. So it may not affect all the way up to cervical. And that's not to say, you know, if you're going to have one, you're going to have the other because that's not simply true. But I, I mean, I think over time, it could definitely have an implication on the other. How bad is the scoliosis and what levels is that would be yeah. my first question to that, you know, to follow up with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And then um, that goes into the, we had a, a question from Stacy about descending syndrome and how that affects posture. And I don't know if you guys have any um, 
knowledge about descending syndrome, but this is a pretty cool uh, idea where everything is, you know, starts to, when we look at posture, it starts from the floor up. And it could be something from a pronated foot. Usually if feet pronate, that's not going to immediately cause TMJ, uh, TMD. See, I did it. I knew I was kind of. <laughs> but uh, depending on how far out of alignment things are, we really want to make sure that our posture is as good as it can be throughout the day. It's not going to be perfect, but as good as it can be. And we set ourselves up for success um, with daily tasks like talking on the computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I mean, to give an example, if you have a leg length discrepancy, you know, one leg longer than the other, that's going to shift everything up the chain. You know, your hip, your back, all of that gets shifted, and you're you're uneven to that point. I mean, then you start getting tight muscles, weak muscles, and the sides are no longer even and equal. So I think that's again what's going to compensate for the other, and then it, it could move up the chain and affect that. There's actually a, so there's. A few different schools of thought of how dentistry is taught and one of them one of the institutes and in when they teach is just like you mentioned where they kind of do everything um, floor level right with your bite mm -hmm. um, because really what it comes down to with most people who have TMD issues is that if your bite is off or you're occluding incorrectly or not on a horizontal plane then um, that's going to cause your muscles to overact or, or chew funny or bite funny so use mm -hmm. occlusion is a very important part of it um, but those are one of the strategies, again, different schools of thoughts for different people. Not all dentists are going to agree with this. I mean, people mm -hmm. learn from different institutes, but um, that is a very popular strategy for, for people. Yeah. That's, that's oh, awesome. Sure. I always kind of go back to that, you know, as people, we get into these habits um, and looking at our motor patterns and the way that we do things, just like you mentioned. So, um, you know, you brush your teeth kind of the same way each time. You always, for me, I, I use my right hand and I start on my left side. I just, I know that I do that um, and I just don't start on this side. It's just more comfortable, right? To go across the body. And I think when we eat, people will have the tendency to chew more on one side than the other. And yeah. it's not exactly an even thing. So that um, can really lead to a weaker side versus a stronger side. Yeah, for sure. Um, so next question from yes. Ashley, you know, how do the cervical bones in my neck, how can they affect the TMJ? So, I mean, kind of what we just, what we just talked about, <laughs> you know, if you have dysfunction in the cervical spine, then again, that could lead to poor posture pain, which could then lead to jaw issues um, with it being interconnected. When you all are evaluating a patient and you see maybe that they have um, a, a bit of forward head that you, you feel might be contributing to their TMD, um, is there anything, how would you give patients the best education there? Um, you know, in regards to that or in regards to their posture. So when you had mentioned posturing your neck forward, a little bit more forward. So when we're doing a comprehensive evaluation, we're looking at the muscles, we're looking at their posture, we're looking at their bite, how the jaw works together. But one thing that kind of stands out is if your head has to posturally move forward, then maybe there's an airway issue. Mm -hmm. that we need to talk about also because if you're trying to prop your head forward you're trying to possibly try to breathe better right. um and so we look at that as well if we're not breathing efficiently or effectively then that connects itself to bruxism or clenching and grinding oh. so that the lower jaw tries to thrust itself forward just to try and maintain an open airway so that's the connection with bruxism the clenching the grinding the joint pain, excessive muscle strain, and then the airways involved with it also. So if we see that, then we may recommend a sleep study or an evaluation of the airway, um, just because airway is a whole nother complete oh, yeah. topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's one thing out of all of the things that we look at just to see what's going on. Because like we said earlier, it's not just one exact clear-cut reason as to why you could be having symptoms but we have to look at everything in the big picture that's really awesome that's i science. love that mm -hmm. yeah i never i mean i didn't know that and you know our school of training too is if someone comes in with knee pain we actually go above and below the joint so we look at the hip we look at the foot just kind of like we talked about you're just not narrowing in on that one thing you need to look at all the other things involved to really figure out what could be causing it so I like that. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, all right. So Sarah, I think this one's for you. Um, 
when I do exercises that involve opening the jaw, should I keep my jaw in alignment, meaning where it is constricted and very tight, or allow it to slip out to give it more motion? So that question has a couple um, of layers to it. Um, just because one thing is if your jaw is very restricted and tight, then we should really address that first. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's symptoms, then maybe we're talking about some warm compress. We're talking about trying to minimize the pain to begin with, because if we're trying to do exercises that may worsen the pain, then we don't want to do that. Um, so we want to get rid of the pain first. So maybe anti-inflammatories, massages, um, different things like that. But I would never recommend an exercise that would purposefully put the joint out of its socket or out yeah. of its I completely agree. So, yeah, I, yeah, I was reading that as well. And I'm thinking, well, why would you want? And, and you know, people are just trying to follow instructions and do exercises, but something right. else is happening. So you probably yeah. shouldn't be doing that exercise in the first place okay. if it's right. putting you so, in that spot. Yeah, so you definitely want to try and minimize stress and strain until mm -hmm. things normalize a little bit and right. then you see what you can do at that point. But you ah. never want to stress or strain anything when it's an active inflammation or active symptoms. And, and that being said too, I know we had discussed earlier, um, especially with something like this, if it's really having severe problems, you definitely need to come in and just get an exam, get a consult yeah. from your, your dentist or your physician before you try to do some of these things on your own. Yeah. Um, especially because your jaw has a very, there's a range of motion that is unique for each individual uh, person. Mm -hmm. And if you go outside that range of motion, you're just gonna end up causing more damage and more harm. And it's always best to just make sure that you're visiting with a, a professional physician and doctor mm -hmm. of some kind. Yeah. You're making sure that everything's okay before you engage in some of these. Some home remedies. Yeah, type yeah, yeah. no, and that's huge, Daniel. And we, we forgot to kind of mention that at the beginning, you know, this is meant for an educational piece um, right. for yeah. people to, you know, understand the facts and the myths and, and whatnot. But yeah, everyone needs an evaluation, a consult, because mm -hmm. I mean, not one thing is going to work for everyone. Right. So exactly. yeah, I definitely agree with that. All right, perfect. So um, next one, again, can tight facial neck muscles throw your jaw and TMJ discs out of alignment? And that was from Jennifer. Um, so like had, we had discussed before, you know, if one side is tighter, if you chew more on one side, you have a hyperactive muscle, of course, that's going to shift everything a little bit. Um, so those tight muscles are, again, going to throw, for lack of a better word, your jaw out of whack. I guess. <laughs> right. Right. Your jaw also, it, you have a condyle and the disc sits on top of it. And so that disc will get beat up and worn down too. So again, when you, you hear people talk about like the, uh, their TMJ came off their disc or something like that, it's very similar um, to just having a, a worn out knee, right? So you have bone against bone and, and that yeah. can cause problems as well in your joint. Right. Yeah, just like a meniscus in your knee. I mean, same, right. yeah. And, and we awesome. all do, you know, we're, we are all are getting a little older every single day and things do wear out a little bit, but it's right. super important to, to use your body appropriately so that we minimize the wear and tear that we place on our bodies. Um, you know, to those knee, you know, if you've run a thousand miles, um, you really want to make sure that you, you do the right things to, to do the maintenance care in between. Right. Just like, right. you know, you, you get chains of oil in your car and do those little things, make sure you rotate tires. You want to take care of yourself with good, healthy activities to, to minimize the, the breakdown. Yeah. Yes. Prehab over rehab. That's <laughs> what we say. <laughs> but, um, all right. So, you know, this is kind of a, again, a loaded question and something that you probably would need a, a consultation first, but um, Lucy asks, are there certain exercises and things we can do to reduce the problems we're having and the pain? And so I'll ask you guys this as well, but when we do an evaluation of somebody who has um, TMD, you know, we look at their opening, we look at their closing, you know, their protrusion, how they move side to side. And so a really good exercise we like to use is get someone in front of a mirror. So you have that visual feedback and you basically want to work at opening your mouth in a pain-free a pain -free, um, right. range of motion. So we always tell people to put their tongue to the roof of their mouth 
and try to open and make sure you're not deviating to one side, making sure you're staying straight and then using the mirror as feedback. But again, doing all those exercises in a pain-free pain. range. Right. Nothing should be slipping out. Nothing should, you shouldn't be pushing past pain. I mean, I think or, that's- Or push through it. I think it's very, um, yeah. you know, kind of, uh, yeah, we're always so push through the pain, push through the pain. It's gonna hurt a little bit. I don't think that it has to. I don't know if you guys are of that same mindset as well. It seems like it. When it comes to, to your TMJ, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to have any type of pain or push through anything. Uh, but that is a great way for an evaluation to, you know, just looking at the chin posture when people open and close. Um, because if there is a deviation to one side, typically the side that you're deviating to is going to be the side that actually is problematic. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe we can talk a little bit about, I know some of the questions are asking about, um, prevention and what what they can do to make things better and so one of the things that we always recommend for our patients and really every individual should have is a night guard and so I'll let Sarah talk a little bit more about that because a night guard is a great way like just how Nick mentioned you want to get into prevention you want to do things to kind of help make sure that you have um, good long-term success right like you mentioned yeah. for runners right you're gonna have to ice your knees you're gonna have to do different things to make sure that you can continue to go run marathons mm -hmm. and a night guard is a simple solution to make sure that you're not wearing down your teeth and you're protecting your joint. So Sarah can kind of explain a little bit about what that is. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a night guard is huge in our practice and for our patients, I would say at least 95% of uh, my patients have some kind of, mouthpiece um, to separate the teeth from each other just because during the day at night especially at night we don't really know what we're doing to our teeth to our teeth um, just because we could be clenching we could be grinding and so it's this little piece of plastic or acrylic that helps to separate the teeth that's what you grind through um, as opposed to grinding your teeth um, and it just helps to stabilize the joint as well so that you're not putting as much stress and strain on the joint um, and there's a couple of questions that talk about stress during the day. So even for our patients that know that when they're working out, they're lifting weights and they clench their teeth together, have a piece of plastic, right? That's where your mouth guard comes from, your night guard. Right. Um, and we customize ours for our patients so right. that they're hard, they're, they're thick enough to be durable, but not so large to where they're uncomfortable. We wanna make sure that you love it and you can't really live without it. Um, that's, that's at least the case for me yeah. when every night before I go to bed, I have my night guard. And if I forget it, I get up and I go get it because I know that I can be causing a lot more damage to my teeth if I don't have that there. And it definitely helps to stabilize the joint, keeps it healthier for a longer period of time. And so here's the thing about the actual, like having a night guard made, you know, professionally is that we make sure that when you occlude, all of your teeth are touching at the same time. And so that's a little different than having like one that you can try to make at your house, so like a boil -a bite or something like that. I've tried to do that. Because it's it, terrible. Okay. So the, only, uh, <laughs> the reason why it makes it so much better is because, again, we want to make sure that all of your occlusion is even. That's what's going to make your joint stable. If you start hitting one side before the other and it starts mm -hmm. moving, then you're going to be out of whack all over again again so it's very important especially when you go to your dental office that they do the adjustments for you to make sure that you are contacting evenly on every surface at the same time that's where the, the functionality of the night guard comes in yeah. and I know some people ask like you know that they have a night guard and that they wanted that they're still having issues that can happen but one of the things that we always recommend our patients too is that when you come in to get your regular checkup bring your night guard with you and most people forget that Okay. Now, you're going to wear it down. And just like Nick mentioned how he favors to, to brush his left side first, and some people favor to chew more on one side than the other, you can do that at night when you're grinding. So you may be grinding your night guard on one side, but when you go in for your next checkup, they can reevaluate and re-equilibrate your night guard again to Level make sure out. that you're biting levelly again. Okay. So just I like you, that, yeah. Just because you have one doesn't mean that it's going to be – you know, like that's it. You only need one for the rest of your life. It's still right. going to need to be adjusted as well. And so maybe that can help some of the the discomfort that they're having, just making sure that you're taking it back regularly. And there's always maintenance. It's just, maintenance. it's maintenance. And also the material makes a big difference because the ones that are professionally made, they're hard. Um, so they're, they're rigid and 
the ones that you can get over the counter, like at the store, those are great for, you know, for one week or two weeks if you're in between getting a professional night guard made. But those are typically softer, so it actually promotes more chewing. And then that can wear out and work out your jaw even more, which can make it more tired over time. So the hard one helps to prevent that. Okay. And you mentioned the two materials that they were made with was, was plastic and acrylic? It's acrylic. It's acrylic. It, it's acrylic is what I would say. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you guys made that distinction because, yeah, I think a lot of people say, well, I use a night guard. It doesn't help. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's huge because, like I said, I've actually tried one that I got from the store. You know, you put under hot water, you bite. And it actually ended up making my jaw hurt more because it just, it didn't sit right in it. And I was shifting my teeth to fit in it. And it just, right. I, I, yeah, I rewarmed it, tried it again. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a disaster. So yeah, I think a professionally done one is definitely the way to go. Professional <laughs> help always helps. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. Awesome guys. Um, Great insight. We do want to touch on this. Um, a question from Jennifer, you know, are there signs that might indicate a purely muscular problem rather than the joint itself? And I know when we do evaluations, um, we look for what's called a capsular pattern. So where do you have restrictions? And for the jaw, if it's more likely to be the joint versus musculature, you're going to have the greatest limitation in opening. opening. Um, it's opening protrusion and right. then lateral deviation right. opening pushing your jaw forward and then sliding your jaw so i know those are big words but side. but you know what we're looking for is are there certain movements that you do that are restricted more than others and that will in turn tell us if it is the joint versus muscle mm -hmm. which again you would need an evaluation for you, right. yeah you would need an evaluation from your doctor for sure just because um again not getting into too many terms there's there's different like you hear people talk about getting their jaw stuck open or stuck closed. Those are purely joint dysfunctions mm -hmm. uh, that, that are problematic. When it's musculature though, you can actually just maybe just palpate on the side of your head and you'll feel like they're all just muscles right here. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to clench and chew, it's going to be much bigger than an individual that does not. So, I mean, think about just curling, uh, doing bicep curls, you know, with one arm 50 times a day and that's all you did. One side is going to be way bigger than the other. Your one bicep is going to be way bigger than the other. And it's, going to be, <laughs> and it's going to be very sore. So if you just palpate that area and you see that it, it, it hurts, you know, then you obviously your muscles of mastication are sore. So you are, it's a muscular issue. You're, you're grinding too much. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're clenching. Um, and then, you know, we had someone who actually had a jaw joint replacement. Um, her name was Jessica and, you know, she's, she says her jaw only moves up and down. I can't move side to side. So, you know, what exercises are, are good for me to do or, you know, she has limited range of motion. Um, so for that, you know, like I mentioned earlier with the tongue, just, just kind of keeping that range of motion that you do have because obviously you are restricted. Um, but definitely, and so it, uh, it depends on what type of joint reconstruction she had. Like, did yeah. she have condyles replaced? Was it just the uh, fossa that was replaced? I mean, there's a lot of different things mm -hmm. to consider with that. And so definitely talk to the surgeon who did your work to see if they have any examples or exercises mm -hmm. that you can do um, because joint replacement is, I mean, they're all different. And, and so... You and obviously to watch out for surgical uh, precautions and limitations that you right. want to move into because uh, rather than giving you exercises, um, you know, that, that would be contraindicated for that surgery. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take the conservative approach there. Yeah, because that would definitely be more an advanced case of a TMD. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Again, mm -hmm. case specific. We so, be, um, I, I wanted to ask you guys this question. I mean, it, it was a question from Chris as far as, if you are diagnosed with TMD, are there certain things that you want to avoid as far as any activity? Yeah. Yeah, so um, definitely you just don't want to put too much stress or strain on the joint or the muscles. So I tell patients if they're actively symptomatic that you want to do more of a soft food diet, um, nothing that you're really having to do super crunchy foods, mm -hmm. stay away from jerky, you know, those things <laughs> you can really work out the muscles really mm -hmm. hard. Um, yeah. Try not to take huge bites into apples, you know, maybe cut up the apple into pieces um, so that you're not having to, you know, like overextend 
the jaw so much um, and just try to minimize the stress and the strain that you're putting. Um, sometimes once the symptoms are subsided, even chewing some gum, like some, not like crazy bubblicious or anything like that, um, but sugar-free gum, uh -huh. uh, it will just help to, <laughs> it'll help to lubricate the joint a little bit so that it keeps things a little healthier. Um, and then the side effect of having, you know, sugar-free gum is that it increases the salivary flow, which is great for, you know, preventing cavities, things like that. So on a side note, um, but just trying to minimize the stress and the strain that you would be exerting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. Very cool. I like it. Yeah. Cause I, I wasn't sure about the gum thing. I, I would assume that, I mean, it might aggravate it in some cases. Yeah. So not during active right. pain. Yeah. Right. You definitely want to stay away from that. You don't want to overexert anything. Um, but when everything is, is settled and healthy, then mildly chewing gum not you know crazy hardcore you're not trying um, to pack a gum a day yeah, or something. Not yeah. like that bubble tape like yeah. no. <laughs> Go through the whole thing. <laughs> well it loses its taste and then you have to put more in so it's a bad cycle um <laughs> i'm throwing her pack of bubble wishes out <laughs> no. um all right we um from lola you know i have actually one cheek that's noticeably bigger than the other side and what can i do about this okay um couple i mean a couple things right we did talk about how you can favor one side so if it is just you chewing or clenching or grinding on that side then having a night guard or a day guard or something a separation of your teeth to prevent the grinding will help um, if it's your cheek that's swollen, though, I mean, it could be a multitude of reasons why your cheek is swollen. Um, again, you would definitely need to get an evaluation because it could be tooth related. It could be parotid gland related. It could be a, a bunch of different things. It could be just the, the facial skeletal, you know, dynamics of everything, mm -hmm. position of the joint or your skull, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. Just to get a further evaluation right. for sure. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. All right. And then I, I think really, you know, a lot of people had questions on strengthening exercises, strengthening exercises for the jaw. And I know during physical therapy, we like to do a lot of isometric exercises, um, mm -hmm. you know, just light, lightly meeting that resistance in a pain-free range. Mm -hmm. um, so doing that, you know, with opening, keeping your hand here meeting the resistance as you open, and then you can do the same on, on all sides, depending on where you're weak and in what direction you would need to go in. Right, um, and, and how your, your joint is healing, right? You don't wanna be doing uh, aggressive strengthening during a, a phase of inflammation. Um, really getting down, um, as Daniel mentioned earlier, getting that pain down, getting the inflammatory effects down from your injury, regaining your range of motion, and then it would be a matter of strengthening. Um, and so we'd be happy to, you know, walk through anybody who has questions about that. Um, we can show you some great exercises further um, in any in a telehealth evaluation. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Botox, Botox injections. Talk to us about your magic. Yeah. <laughs> we want to so, know what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, I'll let, uh, so Sarah's, um, she's really... Well, <laughs> she's more versed in Botox than I am, I guess. But yeah, it is a great way to, for treating TMD. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll let Sarah explain a little bit about it because it does have limitations. Yeah, so it's more for temporary relief um, just because it is something that would consistently have to get um, taken care of. Um, so you would have to visit, you know, whether it be a plastic surgeon, an oral surgeon, your dentist, mm -hmm. um, so that you can get these treatments because usually Botox, whether it's for cosmetic purposes or therapeutic, um, the Botox is going to last for about three months or so, give or take. Okay. Everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, when I tell my patients, Botox is going to be more of an adjunct to a night guard or splint therapy because we need to figure out what's going on with the bite with the joint and so the botox um, is something to help or aid in addition to the other therapies that are already being implemented so it's not the cure-all for mm -hmm. tmd issues um, but it can definitely help 
because mm -hmm. Botox will just help to minimize the pressure and the forces that your muscle is putting on when you are clenching and grinding. Okay. Um, so you're still going to clench and grind, just not with the same amount of pressure and, and um, strength that you normally would. Um, but like I said, it's something that has to get repeated or so every three to four months. Um, and it's a little bit of a, um, uh, what's the word? So you kind of have to go back and forth with your doctor to figure out what the right dosage is, where the proper locations are, because you can always do Botox right here in the masseter. And so they'll put maybe three or four five, six different little sites within this belly of the muscle because it's so strong, but it depends on the symptoms because they can also put injections right here at your temporalis. They can even go to the back of the head over here. It just depends where the stresses and strains are. So sometimes it is um, kind of a little bit of figuring out what works for each patient. Yeah. So it takes a little bit of time to figure that out, but Botox is a great therapy. Um, depending yeah. on the patient. Okay. Yeah, no, I like that because a lot of people have that question, you know, is it going to stop my nightly grinding? And, and like right. you said, it's not, it's not going to stop it. It's going to put less pressure. You're going to feel force. less pressure. Right. right. Yeah. And we actually had a question from Marlene, you know, does um, myofascial releases help with, with teeth grinding? And so again, another conservative treatment we could use. Mm -hmm. um, it, do you it, to... Yeah, it is teaching either having a therapist, having a physical therapist perform myofascial release or teaching the patient how to do myofascial release and massage techniques themselves. Um, and like you guys said, you know, the, the masters, these jaw muscles, the temporalis, those are two of the really big muscles of chewing um, that we can definitely work to loosen up some of that tissue, decrease some of the tension, um, even get rid of some of the trigger points that happen within those muscles. Um, because all muscles are, are just overlapping bodies and, and to contract they're gonna go over, but sometimes those those fibers really don't align very well. Maybe we have been grinding a lot or, or just overusing one side or there's just injury. And so those, mu those muscles need a little bit of help in just figuring out where the alignment goes so that they can work uh, better, more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now, <laughs> Daniel, GERD, what is, um, can you explain a little bit, does that have any connection with teeth grinding? Or what is that? Yeah, it's, um, again, it's more of like a roundabout thing. Um, we kind of alluded to it earlier. So um, we all kind of have a tendency to clench and grind our teeth at night. But for people who really, um, like uh, they can struggle with their airway again, and they kind of posture forward and they're, and they're grinding because they're trying to have an open airway. Okay. Uh, it can sometimes cause issues or there's, I mean, there's small correlation with the fact that maybe it's caused because of GERD, you know, that, that you're having acid reflux. But again, you'd have to get that checked out, you know, from your doctor. Mm -hmm. What we tend to, to see a lot of though, is that because we all have a tendency to grind our teeth at night, that those individuals who have GERD, they tend to break their teeth down faster because of the high acidity content in their mouth coupled yeah. with the clenching and grinding, they're just breaking their teeth much quicker. Mm. And so then that's where I think they get the idea that, oh, well, my, my GERD is causing my temporal mandibular uh, dysfunction when it, it's not, it's just that your teeth are, they're just more susceptible at this point because the yeah. acidity is causing them to break down more and your clenching is wow. causing it to, to be worse. So uh, is there a correlation? Um, sure, it's probably a slight and a roundabout way that's there, but definitely if you suffer from GERD and you're grinding your teeth, you're gonna notice a lot more damage to your, your teeth and your oral cavity than you are on, than other individuals who are not um, having GERD symptoms. Yeah, oh, for sure, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, a lot of people too ask about, you know, stress relievers, you know, during the night, obviously you don't know when you're grinding. Um, right. so you guys mentioned the night guard, mm -hmm. um, and people even ask, well, during the day, you know, I don't even realize I'm clenching or, you know, how do I, and I think you, you did mention a day guard as well, right? Yeah. yeah. So we do do them too. So, uh, historically we make our night guards, they fit on our top jaw and our top teeth when we sleep at night. But we understand that it can be, again, it's kind of big, it's kind of bulky, it's not something you can use during the day, especially if you need to talk to people, you know, you're at work, you've got things going on. So we can make a thinner one for you and we can 
um, make it to go on the top or on the bottom. If it's, you know, just something to let, show a little less than having it on the top. Mm-hmm. And you, if you can wear it during the day and function with it at, at work, or if you know that you're going to be in a meeting or, you know, that driving in traffic stresses you out or different stresses throughout the day where you know that you can put that in and wear it. It's not necessarily something that you have to wear 24 hours a day. It's just, right. if you, you can pinpoint those times of high stresses throughout the day, then you can wear that. Mm-hmm. Also just being aware of it. I mean, most people like, uh, it's a habit you know and you can break a habit as long as you're aware of what you're doing Mm -hmm. and so so just kind of be mindful if you're sitting at the computer and you feel that you're you notice that your teeth are together open up your teeth like that separation occur or if you're in traffic or you're on a conference call we have all these crazy zoom meeting now that everyone has to be (laughs) on right so um all that can be really stressful and if you just kind of monitor your symptoms throughout the day you actually realize you know what i am clenching my teeth let me open them up Mm -hmm. and slowly just start to break that habit yeah Yeah, no for sure that's good good way to help that's good and and we're always huge advocates too for you know stress relieving techniques such as you know breathing techniques and relaxation and meditation and Mm -hmm. i think those are a huge thing that you know if you suffer with anxiety or just general everyday stress, they're good techniques to implement into your lifestyle that could hopefully help with that overall stress as well. So, yeah. And we don't miss that Houston traffic. <laughs> that was stressful. <laughs> Six it's lanes, everybody going 90. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the traffic, the traffic is intense. <laughs> but that's really good that if you do feel yourself clenching and grinding whenever, to just allow your jaw to relax at a comfortable position to open the, those back molars, right? Uh, and maybe replace that habit with some deep diaphragmatic breathing just to yeah. you know, be aware of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, because no, your teeth should never be touching each other unless you're chewing or swallowing. Mm-hmm. Every okay. other time, they should just very passively be separated. So I'm like, I'm just like thinking about it as we're talking. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just something to be aware of because a lot of yeah. patients, they just don't know that. And so now that they're like, oh no, I never clench, I never grind. And then the next visit, they're like, I do. I, like, I <laughs> feel it, I, I feel totally. it now. Yeah. So it's just being aware of it. And then you're you're more noticeable. That's just more noticeable for you. Yeah, no, that's that's huge. I think just being aware of it and then you may realize you're doing it, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nick, what about use of a, a TENS unit? Um, I know Libby kind of alluded to this. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. So is that, again, just more of a conservative treatment? It is a conservative use? treatment. There's pretty low risk with the TENS unit. And we'll just, I'll start living with what a TENS unit is. Right? It's electrical stimulation um, that overstimulates the nerve. So it takes a higher threshold of sensation to then register to your body as pain or as sensation at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you typically with a TENS unit, you get some sticky pads. Um, that have a a good conduction to them and you place them around the pain. So if it was your TMJ joint, depending on how big your pads are. Well, again, and you should be, you should have a consultation before, you know, and and they can tell you where to place it depending on your situation. Yeah, and and then what uh, what signals to use, right? What, uh, there's several different types of of frequencies to use Mm -hmm. and how strong to go. But uh, it's gonna be a temporary relief of discomfort because you are overstimulating those nerves around the pain. Yeah. And so, so it's just not- the same, you know, Botox injections, myofascial relief. So all, all methods of some temporary relief. Correct. You know? um, yeah, this, but ultimately um, fixing the problem. Is is, where we want to focus our yeah. energy on. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, so Sarah, you know, we had Ann ask, you know, does mild uh, TMD go away on its own? I mean, people that experience it once, twice, is there something that they should be doing to solve the problem? Does it just go away? I mean, I know this is really depending too. Well, so the symptoms may go away with all of the um, symptom relief treatments that we've been talking about. So you have your night guards, you have your massages, you have maybe the Botox, or if you're taking, you know, ibuprofen or Advil, you know, something to minimize the symptoms. So the symptoms can always go away, um, but the joint will always be there. And so if you overexert it, if you do something that aggravates it or flares up, there could always be flare ups um, later on down the line, depending on what you're doing. You know, if you are eating like that hardcore jerky, that maybe it's not the best thing, then 
Yeah, very yes. good. That's what happen. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm guilty of that too. I right. mean, of we course, all, we love it, you know, but right. we have to know what our limits are. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something right. that will ever just cure itself or disappear, but there's just things that you may have to manage mm -hmm. and you just have to know yourself and know what your limits are. And, and some of it is just, again, it's stress induced, right? I mean, right. so if mm -hmm. you had a mild form and it went away, maybe take a look at what was going on in your life at that particular time. So, yeah. I mean, maybe you're going through finals, maybe you're get, planning a wedding or you just had a baby or you know, all kinds of things that during that time Rock period on. cause you to have more stress. Yeah. And so maybe it was, you study for finals, you're stressed out, your joint hurt, your muscles hurt. And then after finals are over, you realize like, you know what? It, it's not bothering me. And yeah. chances are it's just because you're just highly stressed at that one particular time or that one moment in time. And now that that major stress has kind of subsided, mm -hmm. so has your clenching and grinding. And the joint will always change just because we're <laughs> maturing, we age, and we use our joint and our muscles all day, every day. We're eating, we're chewing, we're talking. So there's a ton of movement. And so um, there's images that you know we take as your dentist or the oral surgeon takes images of the joint and they can progressively look at how the joint is aging, if it's changing, what the wear looks like on it. Um, just because the same with your knee, you can get arthritis in any joint and so you can even get arthritis in your jaw joint. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that can always get evaluated. Um, and just things are always changing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. I guess if you are having symptoms, then it's a great time to start to look at that problem a little bit uh, more in depth and at least start, um, mm -hmm. start the conversations with your practitioners, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. cool. For sure. Um, and then I know several people had um, questions about, you know, TMD and ear pain and a congested feeling and, and sinus issues. And, you know, are those, are those all related? You know? um, uh, again, kind of like in a roundabout way, yes. I'm going to start with just like the sinus issues of it. Um, so when you, when you clench and you grind your teeth, your maxillary sinus is just, it's right up here. And so depending on how close the, the roots of your teeth are to your sinus, you can actually, um, you can have some irritation. Or if you have a sinus infection, it can actually make it feel like your teeth hurt or that you like, you've got a bunch of sensitivity in your teeth when really it's just your maxillary sinus is a little inflamed mm -hmm. or swollen. So that there's a very close like correlation between those two and where it can feel again, like your tooth is hurting, but it's really your sinus and, and vice versa. Mm. Now, the temporal mandibular joint in and of itself is very, very close to your, to your ear where that hinge access is. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having some inflammation or some soreness in your joint, then it can make it feel like it's an inner ear problem and vice versa. I know some people were asking too, like, is, it, is having TMD problems the source of my dizziness or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, Historically, no, you know, I mean, it, it's typically an inner ear problem that you're, you're having some form of vertigo or dizziness or that kind of thing. And that's something that you would have to get checked at with your practitioner um, or your, your medical doctor to see what's really the, causing your dizziness to occur. Um, but it can feel that way just because of the proximity of where your joint is to your inner ear. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people had that question as far as the dizziness. And, you know, I had spoken with Nick, I said, well, I don't, that, to me, that seems it could be a vestibular issue. So I guess just bringing in other specialists, as, as such as a right. vestibular specialist or an ENT, if someone's ENT having problems fantastic. with their sinuses, mm -hmm. yeah, because right. there could be more going on there. And yeah. a physical therapist can be a vestibular specialist um, mm -hmm. as well, but an ENT is also a great practitioner to look into if you are having yeah. significant yeah. dizziness um, that's not going yeah. away especially if it's positional right if i every time i turn to the right i i know that i'm going to get that dizziness it's going to last for about 15 seconds 20 seconds or so the room is spinning that that's a really good sign of a vertigo um or bppv is what it's called yeah well and i think too like next question kelly you know having to do with tinnitus so again same thing is that connected to you know, TMD, is there other things going on? So again, being evaluated by a vestibular specialist. Would be best would be for, sure. for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. All right. Um, 
Okay, we answered. What is the best one. way to relocate a dislocated jaw? Says Brandy. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll leave that one. Yeah, leave that one. <laughs> so definitely uh, leave that to your your dental professional. There's a technique that is involved with doing it. Um, without getting too much into it, you know, um, I think Nick mentioned earlier that your TMJ is very unique in the fact that not only does it um, like pivot, but it translates, like it has to go up and down a slope. And mm -hmm. so when people talk about getting their jaw stuck, like it goes to open, it's the fact that the condyle goes in front of the disc and it can't come back. So you're essentially having to get the condyle to jump back underneath the disc. So it's not just a straight backwards movement. There's some different things you got to do. Um, funny story in dental school, I, we were <laughs> taking our finals very stressed out and it happened to me. I had a non-reducing subluxation. So my jaw was, it got stuck open. And Sarah, I was there. Yeah, Sarah I was there to help. <laughs> do you have a picture? You, we, had no. just, we had just gone over this in lecture oh and we had just started dating and I put his jaw back into place, right. and that was that yeah. was love. That was. That was, <laughs> that was, that was, was the greatest. He's like the one. Yep, yep, that sealed the deal. Yeah. So on that note, to to really tell honestly, like if you feel because you're not going to walk around with just like oh. I can't close my mouth. And some individuals it will happen, but not not in everybody because it's just a matter of the bone going in front of the disc. And what you immediately feel is that only your front teeth are touching and you can't get any of your back teeth to touch. That's usually an indication that your, your condyle has come off of your disc. And so it's one of those things where the sooner that you can be seen by a practitioner to put it back, the better, because then the muscles are just going to tighten and get really sore. Right. And then you'll end up having to visit with an oral surgeon to get some muscle relaxants put into your muscles and then it, they'll manipulate it so that it goes back in place for you. Oh. Uh, but really it's one of those things where it's, Time is uh, of, the of the essence there for you. The sooner yeah. that you can get it done, the better. Mm -hmm. If you wait days, it's going to be harder, you know, for sure. I understand yeah. that you may not be in that situation where you can go right away or uh, maybe your significant other isn't a dentist, <laughs> you know, but um, <laughs> yeah, the sooner that you can do that, the better. But that's typically the hallmark sign that you'll notice that something is wrong is that only your front teeth are touching and you can't get any of your back teeth to occlude. Interesting. And, and, and that's a, a sign of it being stuck open. Yeah, that seems like that'd be a huge problem. I mean, that yeah. and did it, and I mean, after she replaced it, I mean, was that painful? Were you? So oh, it's no. So it for me, it wasn't. Again, depending on the condition of your disc and, and your joint, how long it's been, mm -hmm. it be a little bit uncomfortable. But it was actually an immediate release of uh, like it, it was just amazing to have oh, yeah. all your teeth contact again and everything else you know, to really just regain that function again. Um, it was so much better because meanwhile, the, your condyle is just on, on tissue and it's in a place it's not supposed to be, right? right. So it's going to be a little bit more comfortable. So when it goes back to where it needs to be, it's almost like an instant relief. Like, oh man, this is so much yeah. better. And then your teeth are touching, things are right. back to normal. But it happened very quickly so. because if we, yeah, if it took too long, then the muscle would tighten and then it would just be a lot more uncomfortable for a lot longer. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> that is such an amazing I mean, I'm story. sorry that happened, but that's a good like conversation <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, and then as far as um migraines and stuff too, I mean and that's a big question, the relationship between yeah. migraines and, and TMD. Yeah. Um, and I think that goes back to a, a lot of the conversation that we had about posture, about that forward head. Um, mm -hmm. and, and muscles really working overkill, um, whether it would be grinding or whether it be chewing um, really heavily. Uh, and, and that can contribute to a lot of the, the tension headaches, especially um, those ones yeah. that start at the base of the skull and then work their way up and over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, there's a lot of different kinds of headaches. So you have your tension headaches, you have your cluster headaches, you have all different kinds. So if we can pinpoint that it's related to uh, the the muscles and the joint, then that's something that can get corrected by stabilizing the joint. But if it's a headache unrelated, you know, then 
there's the neurological aspects to it also. Mm -hmm. And that's when you would visit your physician. And then, so there's a lot of different, it's not just a one size fits all kind of answer. Yeah. Um, it just really depends on where the headaches are, what the causes mm -hmm. are. If they're in the morning, you know, right when you wake up and you feel everything really sore in this area and you have a headache, then yeah, sometimes more than likely it'll be joint related or muscle related. Mm -hmm. um, but it just really depends on where and when these headaches happen. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. Awesome. And then um, we just have a couple quick last questions and I thought this would be a good one for you guys. You know, how do you find, uh, Rebecca asked, how do you find a good dentist or orthodontist to consult with about TMD? Are there people that specialize in it? I mean, what would you guys recommend? Um, well, it's one of those things where like, we're fortunate enough to live here in Houston and Houston is a humongous city. There's a lot of great professionals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can't say as, I don't know what other cities are like, but I can't say enough great things here about Houston. Um, there's so many wonderful professionals here that are, that can help, whether they be orthodontists, whether they be general dentist, there are dentists that go back and specialize. Um, it's not a formal specialty, but they do their training specifically in the temporal mandibular joint. And yeah. so you can go to their practice where they are licensed dentists, but they don't do any dentistry other than working on TMJ and airway and airway. Yeah, so they will do, connected. they'll do all of your splint therapies. They will um, monitor you to make sure that, you know, maybe like they'll change out your different splints or increase the thickness and how they occlude and disclude. Um, they're, they're great professionals that do just that. Um, yeah. As far as orthodontics, you know, um, Definitely, because again, the main reason that why we have, um, or one of the main reasons why we have lopsided, I guess, musculature use is because of our occlusion. So we want to make sure that all of our teeth are occluding in unison and in a right harmony. And most of that has to do with actually the position of your teeth. So finding a great orthodontist is fantastic. I guess a lot of people have this idea that braces or having orthodontics is simply just because you want to have pretty teeth and that they look nice because they're all in alignment. When in actuality, having them in alignment is going to help how you occlude and how you function and the overall health of your teeth, which is going to help your joint. Yeah. So finding a great orthodontist is fantastic. It's not just for uh, kids or adolescents. It's, it's really for everybody At to, any make, stage of life. to make yeah. sure that you have great occlusion because occlusion is going to cause the biggest issue with your temporal mandibular joint and mm -hmm. with your muscle pain. So making sure that your teeth occlude right is fantastic. So finding an orthodontist would be a great option for you as well. Okay. Um, just okay. talking to your general dentist and, and, and you go for your cleanings and when you ask them, tell them, hey, I'm having some TMJ issues. Um, it, is, can you help me or do you know somebody in the area that I can refer to? Yeah. And I'd, they'd be happy to help you in, in any way. Because a lot of general dentists, they have fantastic knowledge of it. But if it's something that is needs further evaluation, more imaging, if it's a little bit outside of their scope of comfort, that's where you have the TMJ specialist. You have your oral surgeons. Um, there, there are a multitude of people that can help. And so it's always kind of a a team approach yep. at times. And do those specialists, did they have credential, like like a specific certification after their name or how would people know? So um, within, within orthodontists, you can look them up and you can see if they're board certified, if they're a board certified orthodontists. Okay. 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 Now, as far as like um, the general dentists, we're all either going to be DDS or DMDs. Um, okay. And when you go to the TM, like, the TMJ specialist who's just doing the TMD disorders, mm -hmm. um, they'll be, they can be dentists as well. I think there are medical doctors that specialize in it as well. So you'll see them with either like an MD okay. or a DO after their name. Um, but yeah. like, especially here in Houston, um, there's one fantastic uh, guy here. I don't want to get like shout out with his stuff without you know letting him know, but he, he's a dentist as well. And he just went back and did many years of formal training and research. And so um, he is he's our go-to uh, TMD referral for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, there's guys like him, I would imagine, you know, in every you know major city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. you know, if, awesome. yeah, if you ever want to uh, throw his name out there or if he's comfortable with that, then we'd be. Yeah. Happy. Well, and his, and his practice just pretty much says, you know, we're TMJ specialists. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, you can always, you know, Google, look it up. Um, just TMJ specialists in your area, okay. have a consultation, have a conversation. If you're, if you're comfortable with them, if your philosophies line up with each other, that's kind of how you find a practitioner or 
a physician or a dentist in any um, in any way. You just want to make sure that y'all vibe well mm-hmm. and um, yeah. that everything's explained to you properly um, so where you're comfortable. I think that's really important just for healthcare. It's in huge general. education yeah. because I mean, even well, in our field, we have you know, patients that come to us all the time and, okay, well, I have this, but I, the doctor didn't explain what it means. I, I'm not really sure. You know, they, they don't come with information. And so I know a huge part of our job is sitting people down and literally having, you know, a 30 minute conversation on what's going on, because then you're going to have more compliance with people who understand what's going on. They realize right. why they're doing the things they're doing, because it's going to help them functionally and in the long run. And they know that so you care. Huge. I mean, just, yeah. it, it takes time to, yeah. to get that across to people. Like, I'm not right. pushing you out the door. I really want you to get better. Yeah. How can I help? Because right. yeah. what we do, right? I mean, we okay. to, to have people yeah. walk out the door smiling. A little off topic, but yeah, we're very passionate <laughs> about the education piece. So it's no, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Our first visits are usually the longest because there's just there's so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's important so that everyone's on the same page and everyone's a part of the process. Yeah. And and I think yeah, just like this talk. I mean, we had put out the question, and now we've got forty questions uh, <laughs> and. And yeah, we've been going on this topic for an hour. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, we just got, I just want to hit these last two here. Um, yeah. So one from Tiffany, how do you relax your throat during a cricopharyngeal spasm? <laughs> and so we honestly had to do a little bit of research on that one because it wasn't a term that we hear being thrown Very around. Often, yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially in our field. Um, but uh, so, do you want to talk about? Yeah. What we so, found? so what we found, Tiffany, was that uh, a cricopharyngeal spasm is not overly harmful. I'm sure that that can be scary and, you know, kind of get you in a little bit of a panic and anxiety. But really, what you want to do is is breathe through it, try to relax, not tense up. If anything, spasming or going, you know, you really just want to to give yourself that time to just let things calm down and relax, and then those symptoms should be great um, motivation to start seeing, okay, now why are those muscles spasming? So those relaxation techniques, you know, we yeah, Im- kind of spoke about earlier. Imaging, yeah. breathing, right? Uh, yeah, really work on relaxing yourself. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Um, and then last question, you know, from Samara, who should I consult with in order to find out if I have TMD? So as far as a diagnosis. And so obviously we know you guys specialize in this. A lot of people don't know, but physical therapists can, can help with that treatment. Um, and I mean, you just kind of spoke about other specialists that and you can go to Your primary as care well. physician as well. Um, yeah. and a lot of people don't know that in all 50 states, you can actually come directly to a physical therapist for evaluation and treatment. Every state is a little bit differently, um, but we do offer direct access. Um, but for this case in, uh, in particular, um, you know, any one of the, between your dentist, orthodontist, physical therapist, and primary care physicians would be great options. Yeah, oh, for sure. All right, I think we hit oh, all of them. To start. Absolutely. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for like taking Thanks the for time. Having us. You taught us a lot. Today. You did. I <laughs> I learned a lot. I, yeah, that was fun. That was great. And yeah, if you guys are okay with it, you know, we'll we'll kind of just post it on social media. And if people want to reach out to you guys directly, how would they get in touch with you? Um, so you can look at our Facebook page. You can look at Montrose Dental Studio. Um, we also have an Instagram page. You can reach out to us. And I mean, if you have a question or anything, I mean, we're happy to answer for you and or point you in the right direction, at least for, uh, if we can't help you directly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're still in the process of uh, building our practice. So coming soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Literally building it. Right? Are you saying yeah. that COVID put a hold on all of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, well, we it was really you fun, you guys. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was a great yeah. time. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel and Sarah. We Have will awesome talk day. to you guys later. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.